Hi, La Casa family, Pastor Jeff here. There's been many new faces in worship over the past few months, and we have a great crowd coming already on Sunday, February 5th, for our new member orientation. It's gonna be at 1 p.m. in Classroom B on the west side of campus near the Fellowship Hall. If you're curious about La Casa de Cristo, if you're curious about asking questions about your faith or just finding out more about our church community, we welcome you to sign up for our special new member orientation. You can call the church office or you can sign up online. We'll look forward to seeing you on Sunday, February 5th at 1 p.m. in Classroom B. And now let's hear from Pastor Wallace about a special ministry that's upcoming here at La Casa de Cristo. Greetings, La Casa family. I'm Pastor Lloyd Wallace, a retired clergyman that's been in the congregation for many years, taught many classes, but one that Jan Robinson got me involved in a number of years ago was the Truth Project that Del Tackett presents. And I was so excited by that that Yes, I took the course, but then also took it again to be a leader for the Truth Project. So on February 11, Del Tackett is himself coming from Colorado, and he will present this opportunity for our congregation here at La Casa and many other congregations in the area if they choose to come. I said, this is something I prayed for, for this congregation. And now it's our opportunity to step up to the plate and see how we can be a partner in spreading the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to our neighbor. And they'll show you how. Oh man, we're out of coffee. That's a bummer I was looking forward to having some. You know, now that I think about it, we sure do go through a lot of coffee here at La Casa. I mean, we love having it set up for all of our different classes and events, and especially for our congregation outside between worship services, especially right now because it's been so cold lately. Maybe I should ask the congregation for some help. I mean, maybe the next time they go grocery shopping, they can pick up some coffee and bring it here to the church. And so we have more coffee that we can make for everybody. That would really help us stay on top of our coffee supplies. Oh, hey, Connor. Were you thinking about asking the congregation to bring in some coffee to help the church? Oh, hey, Pastor Matt. Yeah, I think I'm going to ask the congregation for help. Oh, cool. And you're going to mention decaf, right? We always need decaf. Yeah, even decaf. Lots of people here in our congregation drink decaf coffee. Sounds great, Connor. Thanks. Hey, Pastor Matt, do you have telepathy? Wait a second, do I have telepathy? Hmm, I don't know, Connor. This is getting kind of weird. Maybe we should just start worship. Good idea. <laughs> like a little less coffee in those guys <laughs> might help. <laughs> Oh, Lord have mercy. <laughs> Would you pray with me this morning as we begin our worship together? God, thank you so much for another day in this place together in your presence, the presence of your children, God, our family, our church family. Lord, I just ask that throughout everything that we've planned today and the word that uh, you're, you've given Pastor Jeff to speak and the tech crew and just everything that's going on in here, Lord, uh, that you would just have your way. Just take over. Would you just draw us into your presence this morning? Lord, I've prayed this in the past, just invade the space of our thoughts and our hearts and anything that maybe we've brought in that we're worried about today. And can we just disconnect from all that for a few minutes and experience the glory and the goodness of your grace in this place? We ask that you be honored and lifted up. In Jesus' name, amen. Better to sing this song standing up if you would. If you're able, join us. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He Together we see Everyone sees, holy is the Lord. 
Your name is hope inside me, hope inside me. Your name is love, a love that always finds me, always finds me. Your name is life, your name is life, your name is As we come here in this place, your name is love, just saying, your name is love. And that's what we're going to be meditating on and hearing about today and praying about how your name is love in our lives. It's your righteousness. It's your love that covers us always. Help us to receive that. Help us to respond to it. Help us to share it in Jesus name. Amen. Please grab a seat. and. Uh, I'm going to invite the kids to come up here and stand right in front of the altar with me. So if you guys would come on up. I know there's some of you out there. Come on up. We're going, to, we're going to look at some things today. We're not going to sit down. We're going to remain standing. And we're going to look at something very special up in front here. All right. Come on up, guys. All right. Good. All right. We maybe have some more coming up, too. All right. That's good. Come on up. It's all good. All right. Room for everyone up here. All right. Great. So... This is something very special in our worship life. It's called an altar, A-L-T-A-R. Can we all say that together on the count of three? One, two, three, altar. All right. Now, this altar is very special. It's been a part of our church for actually many, many years because it's been in different places that La Casa de Cristo has called home for worship. It's been in schools. It's been in temporary settings. It's been here when this was a gym. Now it's here when this is a gathering place. So this is a very special altar. A long time ago, not only at the time of Jesus, but even before that, altars were made out of wood, like this one, or they were made out of stone or rock. And I want us to think of the altar this way. It's our family dinner table, okay? Um, what's your guys' favorite food? Tell me what your favorite food is. Is it pizza? Is it chicken? What is it? Any favorite foods you have? You want to share? What do you like to eat? 
What do you think? I like pizza. You like pizza. All right, that's a good thing. Anyone else? Anything good? Yeah. Pizza. You like pizza too. All right, so we got two votes for pizza already, okay? Anything else? All right, you know what? Eating is fun and having a family meal is fun. And I bet you you have a dinner table at your house or a lunch table where you have your meals together. And this is our family meal. And when you guys get to third and fourth grade, you'll go through a uh, time here um, where we share about communion. The pastors teach you about that. And then we learn what this meal is all about. Now, the menu is the same every week here, okay? And that is it's bread and wine because it represents the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So we don't have chicken. We don't have pizza. We don't have steak. We don't have all those different things. But we have bread and wine because that's our family meal together. So um, those are maybe a few things for us to think about. But what's kind of cool to think about is this is for thousands of years, thousands of years, that's a long time, people have gathered around an altar and people have gathered around our family meal time, just like you and I, for a long time. And that makes us part of the whole church of Jesus, no matter where it is in the world. Let's pray together. Lord, we are so grateful to come to this family table called the altar. We are so grateful for this meal, this bread, this wine. Just as we gather for meals in our family home, we are reminded of the special meal that we share together as part of your body, the body of Christ. Amen. I want to thank you guys for all coming up today. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing. And as you head back to your seats, let's move out of our seats and share God's peace with one another. Share the peace of the Lord with each other. We're going to receive our morning offering, and as the ushers go around and receive the offering, of course, some of you also choose to give electronically, and we want to thank you for that as well, for text to give. And uh, after they've uh, passed the plates, we invite you to stand or sit as you desire to share in this uh, time of the musical offering as well. Lord, I come, I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest. And without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you.
I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. seated as we turn to the word this morning. It's found on the page at 683 in the Pew Bible, the Holy Gospel according to Matthew chapter 5. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will be by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But for whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that, unless you, your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Results, results matter. Results matter. Today, there's going to be games in the National Football League, and there were two yesterday, and those that win move on to the conference championship, and ultimately two teams will then move on to the Super Bowl while the losers, their season is over. Results matter. Results matter on the sports field, and they also matter in the business world. If you close the deal, then that's considered a success for your company, and if you don't, then it's a setback. And if your company has a bad quarter, then it's considered a bad result. And if it's a good quarter with profits, then it's a good result. In the educational field, it's all about results from the time we're in elementary school, moving through middle school, high school, on to college, and even graduate school, because there's evaluations, there's progress reports, and there's grades. It's all about results. And we know that the world operates by results. But the challenge we have is then we try to apply that same standard of results to our spiritual lives and we run into trouble. In this gospel that Brenda read for us today, it ends with these rather challenging and chilling words. Unless, unless our righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, we will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And that sounds like a very high bar. For any of you who know anything about the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and scribes, they were meticulous about being obedient to God, following God's command, always being in the synagogue, always being faithful. Somehow this seems like such a high bar. How can we possibly live up to that? 
And today I want to talk about results in life and about our relationship with the living God and also the difference between results and righteousness because there's some terms that we need to come to grips here. And sometimes it's painful for us to face things spiritually, to look at God's word. And, you know, we always want to come and be comforted and hear wonderful music and praise God through wonderful music and, and hear a comforting message. But sometimes the scriptures challenge us and and that is true with our gospel for today that talks about righteousness. So what does this all mean and what are some hard answers? You know, sometimes we don't want to hear things and, uh, and, and we don't like to hear the answer even though it's right in front of us. I want to tell you this morning kind of a, a cute story. It's a funny story about an elderly pastor. Now, before I go any further, that's not a self-descriptive term. So don't apply that to me, please. All right. This is a story about an elderly pastor who was invited over to a member's house for lunch. And it was summertime, so little Jimmy was home from school. And the pastor was sitting there with Jimmy while mom and dad were preparing the lunch for the pastor in the kitchen. And so the pastor asked little Jimmy, well, what are we having for lunch today? And Jimmy says, well, we're having goat. We're having goat for lunch. And the pastor's kind of startled. He says, we're having goat. He goes, are you sure about that? And little Jimmy says, well, all I know is this. I was listening to mom and dad talk last night and they said today was as good a day as any to have the old goat over for lunch. So sometimes we don't want to hear things in our life. Sometimes we don't want to hear things. And today we need to understand something. The results of this world, the results of this world cannot always be applied to our spiritual life because there's a difference between relationship and results. Let me give you an analogy and maybe we can all understand this a bit better. I want you to imagine you have a really good friend. Maybe they're in your neighborhood, maybe they're not, but they've been friends of yours for many years. And maybe when your kids were small, they kind of helped you out and watched the kids if you had to go do something, or, or maybe uh, you borrowed some equipment or tools from them if you were doing projects around the house and, and they were always there for you in that way. Or maybe they watched your house for you if you went out of town during the summer or went out of town during the holidays. And, and all of those were dividends. All of those were results of the friendship and the relationship and the trust that you had built across the years. And there was give and take in that relationship. Not only was it something that you received, but also you offered help to that friend or that neighbor. But you know, results are different than the relationship. If all you cared about were the results of that friendship or that good neighbor, then pretty soon the relationship would deteriorate. If all you did was use them, use them for your own purposes, always using them for what you wanted around your house or in your life, then the relationship would deteriorate pretty quickly. Now we can understand that when it comes to a friend or a neighbor, but we often have a hard time applying that to our relationship with God because here's what's happened. Something goes bad in our life. Something goes wrong in our life. Something goes south. It's terrible. It's a tragedy or it's a, it's a problem in our life, a health-related issue, or maybe there's a, a fragmented relationship in the family, or maybe there's even a divorce, and something goes horrible. And then we turn around and we blame the one whose relationship we have, the living God. And we don't come out and say we feel shortchanged by God, but we feel that way, that we're shortchanged by God. You and I have heard this. I've heard this many times as a pastor. I can't believe this has happened to me. I've always gone to worship. I've always been a part of the church. I'm a good person. I'm a nice person. I can't believe this is happening to me. And the implication is clear that somehow we are shortchanged in our relationship with the living God. God. But if we stop for a minute, we need to understand that's simply the results of our life, both good and bad and indifferent. And as human beings, we will all have those setbacks in those moments, just as we'll have the good times and the mountaintop moments. That doesn't change the nature of the relationship. Let me ask you a question this morning. You know, over the past couple years, we've all had all sorts of issues go on as a result of the pandemic, as a result of the division and fragmentation in our society, as a result of all the challenges that people have had in their workplace. And I want you to imagine that there's only one good person left on the face of the earth. There's only one 
pure and kind and decent person left on the face of the earth. And let's say all of the forces that we are facing today of violence and corruption and evil and problems in our nation and in our world, let's say they conspired against that one person and they were so overwhelming that finally, finally they overcame that person and snuffed their life out. Would that mean if that happened, and that was the last person, that somehow God didn't still love us, didn't still have a relationship with us, didn't still care for us. Well, I have news for you. That's what's already happened. That's why we're here today in worship. That's why we've gathered as God's people in three worship services this weekend, in a concert last night, those of you that were a part of that, to worship and praise him. And so what we know and understand is Jesus was the only pure and perfect and kind and loving person totally and fully that ever lived and his life was snuffed out but through his death we were given new life. Through his resurrection we were given the power to live. And so what we understand is it's not about the results of our life. Those will go up and down. Those will vary. Those will go up and down but the relationship is always there. And if that's the case, then how do we live righteous lives? How do we live up to the words of the gospel? The say, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. You know, Jesus was great at looking at the human heart. And he wanted the Pharisees to see it wasn't about the law, although the law is important. It wasn't about living up to a standard. It was about our hearts. Jesus himself says this. You have heard it said, don't commit murder. I tell you, if you're super angry with your family member, your brother and sister, and you don't reconcile, you've committed murder against them in your heart. You've heard it say, don't commit adultery. I tell you, if you look upon a woman, a man with lustful intentions, you've committed adultery in your heart. You see, Jesus was getting to the heart of the matter. The righteousness in our life that we have only can come from God. And if that's the case, and the scriptures tell us it is, by his wounds we are healed, by his righteousness we live, Paul wrote. If that's the case, then why do we worship? Why do we help the poor? Why are we engaged as a congregation in so much social outreach in our city, in our nation, in our world. Why, why do we do these things? We do them as a response to God's love. We don't do them so that when we die, God's going to review all of our life and say, well, maybe we've made it or maybe we've not. That's not what we believe. That's not how we live. That's the God of the old covenant. This is the God of the new covenant who comes through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to give us a new relationship. I learned something new this week. I, I looked at the Latin word for obedience. And the Latin word for obedience is the word ob adare. And part of that word adare is where we get the word auditory or listening. To be obedient is to listen to God. It's not only about our behavior and our actions, it's about listening to him in our everyday life. And our response, that's righteousness. Jesus summed it all up. He said, you can take all the laws, you can take all the commandments, you can take the entire Torah, you can take the entirety of the Hebrew scriptures, and it all boils down to two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's righteousness. To be in a right relationship with God. Because our responses will never be adequate. But we strive. We learn. We grow together. Here's another way to understand what it means to be righteous. What it means to be in a right relationship with God. There's a man named Charles Lamb who was a naval aviator, a Top Gun pilot in Vietnam, who flew 75 missions off the USS Kitty Hawk shooting down enemy aircraft over North Vietnam, Vietnam. And on his 76th mission, his 76th mission, he was shot down 
by a surface tear missile over North Vietnam, and he ended up spending six years, six years in a prisoner of war camp. Upon his release, at the end of the war, he came home, honorable discharge, and he decided that what he wanted to do with the rest of his life was go around and talk to people and talk to crowds and, and talk to them about his experience in prison. And one day, as he shared his prisoner of war story in Florida, he and his wife were out to dinner before he was to give a talk, and a man walked up to him and said, are you Charles Lamb, the, the naval aviator from the USS Kitty Hawk? Are you that Charles Lamb? And he said, yes, I, I'm that Charles Lamb. He said, I want you to know something. He said, I was a sailor on the USS Kitty Hawk. I was the guy deep in the bowels of the ship who would spend several hours every day packing the parachutes of the fighter pilots. We would pack those cords, those silk parachutes carefully. They weren't like the modern day parachutes. And it would take us two, three, four hours sometimes to pack the parachutes of the pilots. And Charles Lamb goes, I can't believe that. He goes, thank God you packed my parachute because he said on that last mission, I really needed it and I'm here today because of you. And, and, and they exchanged numbers and then the man left, but Charles Lamb couldn't sleep that night. He couldn't sleep one wing. He thought to himself, here I am. I thought I was this hot shot, top gun naval aviator. I had all these credits, all these missions, and I didn't even know the name of the man who packed my parachute to save my life. I didn't even acknowledge him in the hallways of the ship. I couldn't even tell you who he was or what his face was like. And so from that time on, in his talks, Charles Lamb would talk about who packs your parachute in life? Who do you need to be grateful to? Who do you need to say thank you to? Who do you need to say please to? Whose shoulders do you stand upon in your life? Living or dead, it doesn't matter. But that moment of gratitude, that is the right relationship we have. First with thanks to God through Jesus Christ, and then thanks to those who pack our parachutes in life. And Lamb went on to say, it wasn't just my physical parachute, it was my mental parachute and my spiritual parachute and everything else that I need in this journey because we are not alone. We are not alone in this journey. So when we think about righteousness, when we think about that, when we think about what righteousness means in your life and in mine, I want you to think about something else. Not that there's some bar, that there's some barrier that you have to achieve so that you can gain the gates of heaven, but rather that we're all in this together. We are part of a community of faith. During those six months when we couldn't gather for in-person worship in the pandemic, many of you communed at home. And we would consecrate the elements, as I'm going to do in just a minute here, and then we would commune together. But I can't tell you the dozens and dozens of people that came up to me when we were finally back together and said, Pastor, it wasn't the same because we were alone. We weren't together with each other. We weren't a total community together. So righteousness results and a relationship. The great good news for you and me is the relationship we have with God is never dependent upon the results of our life because it's always a gift of His grace. And we will share in that grace in just a few minutes. But remember this, the next time you're tempted to believe your relationship with our Savior is based upon your performance, pause in prayer, give it up to him, and say, it is by grace we are saved. And this is not our own doing. It is a free gift of God. Amen. And so we come to that time in our service where we commune and we share in that special communion together. We share in the fact that this is our family meal. This is our family table. And we recall 
that in that Thursday night in which he was betrayed, Jesus gathered for the Passover meal in the upper room, and he took bread and he broke it. And he said, no longer is this the bread of Passover, but this is now my body given for you. So every time you gather, do this to remember me. And then again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he said, every time you gather to drink this cup, remember to do it to remember me for the forgiveness of sin. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns again. Let us pray our family prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As our communion assistants come forward, and we invite them to come forward at this time, uh, we remind you we commune by intention. If you're visiting with us today, that is a free gift God gives to all who believe in his son, Jesus Christ. And also we are reminded, we are reminded of the fact that you can take the wafer of bread and then dip it into the chalice of wine or hold it over the chalice of wine as you desire. God's gifts are ready for his people. Yeah.
We are grateful for this family meal. We are grateful for your grace and help us to remember that our righteousness is never dependent upon us, but it's always dependent upon your grace and mercy. Also on this day, we recognize there is a part of our La Casa family that are also <laughs> worshiping at this time and gathering together as a community of faith, and that is our high school youth who are on their winter retreat. We ask you watch over them. We know they've had a great weekend, and as they return to the valley, that they be safe. And we thank you that we are the church in many places. And so now, may this meal strengthen us, however we may have received it and wherever we may have received it, to go out into the world and to serve you, knowing that all we do is a response to your gracious love. It is in the name of our Lord that we pray. Amen. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. The Lord look upon us with his favor and give us his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let's stand and sing boldly together our closing song. <laughs> could carry that kind old way it was my too till I met you I was breathing the time alive all my failures I tried to hide it was my dream Till I met you You called my name And I ran 
Come on, you believe this thing is with us this morning. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. You called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Your love. 